Good afternoon and welcome to Entry Point, where we take a deep dive into the latest entries from Encyclopedia of Virginia with the contributors who contribute them for us. I'm Patty Miller, the editor of Encyclopedia of Virginia, and I'm pleased to be hosting today's discussion about the Nottoway Indian Tribe of Virginia. This is the first in a new series of entries hemmed by our special projects editor, Caitlin Newman, about the history and culture of the 11 officially recognized Virginia Indian tribes. For those of you who aren't familiar with Encyclopedia of Virginia, EV is a free, reliable multimedia resource that tells the inclusive story of Virginia history and culture for anyone seeking to understand how the past informs the present and the future. We invite you to explore the best and most current scholarship on the history of Virginia at encyclopediavirginia.org. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes for today. Please share your questions once we finish hearing from our two speakers um, on the Q&A tab in Zoom. And also the event has closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's guests. First, we have Beth Roach. Beth is a Nottoway tribal citizen and the vice chair of the tribes council and a contributor to our new entry on the Nottoway Indian tribe of Virginia. And I'm going to drop a link to our new entry in the chat and invite you to read that after the presentation to take a deeper dive into what is just uh, today just a brief introduction to the long history of the Nottoway Indian tribe in Virginia. And also with us today is Rick Kelly, who is also a Nottoway tribal citizen and one of the co-authors of our new entry on the Nottoway Indian tribe of Virginia. Uh, Rick, we're gonna start with you today. Thanks so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be involved in this project and give us a brief overview, if you will, of our new entry on the Nottoway Indian Tribe of Virginia, realizing we're asking you to compress a, an incredible amount of history of culture into a very short period, but give us a, a taste of this new entry that we have just put up on Encyclopedia Virginia. Okay, well, um, first, uh, thank you all for inviting me to participate in your webinar. I'm um, honored to be able to share a little bit about our history. My name is Rick Kelly. My given name is Rufus Kelly. I'm one of the uh, authors of the Encyclopedia of Virginia article on the, the Nottoway Indian tribe of Virginia. So Patty, your, your first question was, how did I get involved? Okay, so um, I got involved because uh, I care deeply about the history of our people. And uh, Chief Lynette, who has been working on this project for some time, uh, reached out to me and asked me if I would participate. And I think as I shared with some of you all before, when, when our chief asks, it's not something you say no to. I mean, particularly if you have the ability um, to, to participate. So of course, and I, I was immediately on board because like I said, it's a particular um, passion and, uh, and an interest for me to understand the history of our people, but also share it in a way that is uh, understandable for others and that's accurate. Uh, I think that's another kind of a hot button issue for me, um, the accuracy of the information being shared about us. So, you know, Encyclopedia Virginia, as, as um, Chief outlined it to me, you all were reaching out to us to hear our voice, to hear our story and our words. And I don't think there's a better way to really uh, accurately hear the history of a group of people, then particularly from their perspective. So I think uh, that was the first question you asked me. And uh, and then I, the second question was, do uh, uh, you want me to share a flavor of the article? Was that it or? Yes, give us a broad overview of what you think are the highlights of the article. Um, when we did a recent webinar where we did talk somewhat about Virginia and Indian history, a lot of people weren't at all familiar with any of the tribe's histories in Virginia. So for people who aren't familiar what would you like people to know about the Nottoway history? Just, just briefly, what are the highlights? Okay. Um, well, uh, highlights for me, obviously, uh, I love the article. I love the way Encyclopedia Virginia presents it. Um, I, I love the fact that there's a, um, a summary at the beginning for those who need some quick information about us that uh, are you know wanting to kind of put their toe in the water, so to speak. And then 
there's a, a much deeper dive in terms of our article. And then there's a reading list at the end. So if you really want to get after the information as well as the, the multimedia links, it really is marvelous. I think what you all are doing to uh, present the history of Virginia, okay? Um, and in this case, the history of some of Virginia's first people. So um, as, a, as a not only tribal citizen, I guess the thing that I, I would want you all to know is that we've been here for a very long time. Whenever I would uh, talk to my mother uh, and say, well, where did our folks come from? She said, well, we've always been here. Uh, it was never any more than that. It's not, we came from here to there. So we've, we've always been here. So that was an abiding kind of um, element for me coming along, knowing that my family, okay, my Nottaway family has always been here. So that's the first thing I would share with people that Nottaway people have been here long before there was a United States of America, long before there was a Virginia colony. Um, and still we remain. And uh, I'm thankful um, for that. So the, the article itself, you know, as, as a history buff, you know, when I was in college, typically you take history that, you know, from the, you know, colonial to, to 1878 and then 1878 to the present. And, um, you know, our article is divided in similar ways where you can get the history of our people um, pre-colonial, uh, some pre-colonial history, but also from first contact with the English colonists through the 16th, 17th, excuse me, not 16th, I'm 17th, 18th, 19th, and then into the 20th century in the modern day. I think for a lot of people, when we talk about uh, Virginia Indians, and, and I know this was my experience as a, as a child, I was told that we were extinct, okay, that we didn't exist, you know, by teachers and classrooms. And I did, I knew that wasn't true because I, I believed my parents. And um, so, having the opportunity to kind of clear up some of those misconceptions and I understand it you know we've um, been adapting to living um, with others for a very very long time um, so here in this area and uh, you know the Virginia colony is the oldest part of the United States of America so it's easy to kind of overlook us uh, because we've developed skills that have allowed us to survive um, throughout the centuries even in um, situations and uh, and environments that were hostile, you know, for us, uh, we've learned how to adapt and survive, and so we still are here. So that's probably what I, I would um, like for you all to know: uh, the history of people, our resilience, our our ability to adapt and remain, and remain vibrant and uh, and vital to uh, the history of Virginia today. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And now we're going to hear um, from Beth, who um, is also a member of the Nottaway Indian Tribe and also heads up the tribe's environmental initiative and storytelling programs. Um, and Beth has done for us on the actual um, entry itself a really great interpretive tour of the Nottaway River. So if you have never had an opportunity to paddle the Nottaway River yourself, you can do it virtually with Beth and learn about both the importance of the uh, the river to the tribe, but also some of the ongoing uh, modern day cultural and environmental initiatives. So Beth, tell us a little bit about the river and about the tribe's involvement with the river today. Thank you, Patty, Nawe, uh, Rick, it's so wonderful to see you and to see the beautiful image behind Rick. It's uh, that's looking down river of the Nottoway River. And thank you, Peter, for helping me with screen share of slides, because I couldn't tell you about the river and its connection with our people without showing you many pictures <laughs> of what it looks like in practice. Um, so to begin my remarks, I'd love to bring us into a space with our Nottaway language. And when we start meetings and talks and any kind of gathering, we like to share a Thanksgiving address and big kudos to Ben Walters, our uh, language chair, who's been helping us to revitalize our language. And so it starts with You can bring that slide back up. Um, so what we're saying is we are grateful for the people, our egwe hegwe. And so we're so deeply grateful for our ancestors looking so many generations back. We're grateful for all of y'all um, here on this call for listening uh, in on, a, on our story. 
And we're so grateful for Virginia Humanities for being such amazing partners to help us expand the storytelling that is so critical for our environmental work, uh, not only for the Nottaway people, for people at large. Uh, so y'all probably seen this quote before about 5% of the world's population, indigenous people are protecting 80% of its biodiversity. And I'm so proud to share with y'all that the Nottaway tribe, we are, are, are doing our part of that 5%. We're so deeply proud of the Nottaway River and the waterways all around it. And we know that our people uh, lived on this land and in this waters for thousands of years and co-created the space that that helped us sustain for so many years. And so um, we have delved deeply into environmental programming. You can, I'll talk a lot about Clean River Day, but really want to highlight that our Thanksgiving address tells us people, lands, and water. So Egwe Hegwe is our people, our Ine Ahonro, which is our lands, and Awa is our water. So we're being asked to give thanks and gratitude and to become one mind with these elements. And the, also the Thanksgiving address goes on and on and on. Uh, there's examples of it going on for a week. So I have an hour. <laughs> we gotta, uh, we'll focus on the top three. And uh, what I'd love to share with y'all in my time with you is, is just how we are embodying the, the uh, these resources and into our current practices. And so throughout our long history, we've seen many, many changes as a tribe uh, in, our, in our world. You see that highlighted in the entry. Um, you can expand that out to our, our watershed. Um, our current generation actively acknowledges our ancestral teachings and we incorporate that wisdom into our current practices of governance and our community engagement. Um, we mend our relationships to our waters and our lands and our people. And these are critical steps to not only restoring our, our natural world and also restoring our world, which we need to do so much of. And this is what this uh, initiative helps us to do so much. And so the, when we talk about protecting the well being of people, it depends on healthy ecosystems. And so we know that we have to unite with stakeholders and partners throughout our watershed and at large to develop rights based approaches to conservation that's rooted in long term partnerships. I think it took, it took us, what, two years to get this going? And, you know, every bit of that was, was so helpful. And so by doing this, we're creating a very intentional movement of Nottaway River Basin stewards from all walks of life that are preparing our future generations for an increasingly changing and challenging climate. So that's my broad overview. And I wanna show you how we are embodying uh, these connections. Next slide, please. But we have to like go way back. <laughs> I wanna take us way back and imagine, let's use our imaginations and picture uh, all these thousands of years that that we're that we're standing on uh, on history. So if you know anything about the Nottaway River Valley, you know that we have some really incredible features. Um, we have Big Mama, which is one of the oldest uh, Virginia trees, um, up in a cypress grove that was anywhere between 1500 and 2000 years old. Uh, Y'all, that's before Columbus. That's around like before pyramids. I mean, we're talking about ancient trees, even before. These ancient trees, uh, we have archaeological evidence of human occupying this region, North America, that goes back. Uh, the previous acceptance of, of oldest occup human occupied time before Cactus Hill uh, was about 15,000. You probably heard about the Bering Strait, you probably heard about Clovis Points. Those were widely accepted for many years. And then in the mid 90s, an archaeological site called Cactus Hill was discovered that puts human occupation here in North America uh, 18 to 20,000 years ago. So to Rick's point of we've always been here, you hear that quite a bit, um, that we've always been here. Our stories say that, you know, we don't come from the Bering Strait. And so finally, that science, if they had just dug a little deeper, <laughs> they, if you can tell you, you got to challenge these beliefs, you know, they would have unlocked this, um, this knowledge sooner. So we are, um, we're not, you know, there's migrations of people, you know, hear about, we are the most recent indigenous folks of the land, um, but just know that in our in our watershed, when we think about what, what are we protecting, we're, ta we're talking about our stories and we're talking about the stories that go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Next slide, please. So how does this look for us today? I mean, even if you look at our seal, you see our river in there, you see a beautiful cypress tree. The placement of the river uh, is important on the seal and how the roots reach down into uh, the, the tributaries there. And that's where a lot of our archeological or village sites are. And then of course you see our longhouse and that connects us with 
the Longhouse people of our language group, Iroquois. And so we also have our relatives, the Tuscarora and the Meharan, where we are down here as far as, um, and then those up in the north too. Next slide. So I'm going to really dive down deeply into exactly like what we're doing on the river and how it's connecting. But first, I really, I just had to sing the praises of Dr. Kelsey Leonard's work, this uh, Indigenous Adaptation Framework to Sea Level Rise. It's titled Wampum. She published it in early 2021. Uh, she worked with federally recognized tribes in the Northeast. And what they created was this beautiful framework that takes us through different pillars. And it's I found it so beneficial and useful for when I'm explaining to audiences what exactly we're up to and how it all connects. This was developed for sea level rise, yet I can place many more meanings and, and on it. And that's what I'm going to help share with you today. But essentially, it's saying, um, well, first, what is wampum? Wampum is um, dear to eastern woodland seaboard nations. It's a quick uh, clamshell that's from Northeast. You can find it down to the Mid-Atlantic. I have my earrings on, I have my ring on. You've likely seen treaty belts. You see examples of those in our entry. Uh, so always have been very culturally important to our folks. So you have witness, witnessing changes, what's in the animal and human behavior around, uh, what's changing in the landscape. When we witness changes, let's think back to our ancestors. Let's acknowledge our ancestral teachings and learn from them how they would address those changes. When we talk about mending, we're really looking to uh, base our solutions on those ancestral teachings, why we wanna protect future generations, how we have to unite, and then M, we have to build this movement in a culturally minded way. All right, so that's my top level view. Next, let's dive down, next slide. So this is where we get deep into, oh, almost watersheds. So these changes, it's just a little bit of a land-based uh, look for y'all. They're, you know, this is, these are older maps and they show pre-contact what our groups of uh, communities where we were and are. Uh, so Nottaway, Meher, and Tuscarora. So what I would love for you to see here is just how expansive that, that, that footprint is and how we are, you know, we're able to move about freely and be a people all the way up from Nottaway Blackwater Rivers to where they meet to form the Chowan on down the Roanoke River. Um, I'm on a ridge between the Cashi and the Roanoke River in Bertini County, uh, so close to the watershed. Next slide. And then you see in the entry, we start talking about the treaties. And you, from 1650, we learn that that, you know, it was several years or decades after the first contact of Jamestown settlers. And then in the mid 1600s, they start to move into Western Tidewater. And that's when they start to engage with Nottaway. So imagine that massive watershed. And then in 1705, in just 50 years, we're shrunk down to 40,000 acres in these two reservation tracks. So quite a bit of change right there. Um, next slide. And then, so what is this? You, you can read more about what happened, you know, and politically during those times and how we, how our reservation lands uh, shifted and changed. And so I'm bringing us into the present of what we're doing with the lands today. So we started a clean river day about 15 years ago. And this is before we actually had like smartphones and taking pictures. And so all my pictures from back then are super grainy and I have to like go on a, you know, a hard drive to get them. Um, but we started that first year and it was massive y'all. If you look in that middle picture, I don't know if you can see on your screen, but there's a white object. <laughs> and if you're thinking, is that a toilet? Then yes, you're correct. That is a toilet. We found an entire bathroom suite, shower, stall, toilet in the ravine. We found over 30 tires. We picked up equal of that of trash bags. So massive cleanup at first. And then every year we'd go back and it was the first few years, um, really light uh, maintenance. So beer bottles and bait tackle, boxes, fishing lines. Um, but around years five and six of this, we started to find very old trash, like that glass bottle or that beer can. And then right around then we find this giant uh, logging tires. You can see Rick back there <laughs> grimacing about that in the picture. And so, you know, we started to ask questions. Next slide. And again, this is an ongoing yearly thing. And so we it started with a few of us coming out and then we built it into a whole day long thing. So we paddle, we have a social, we eat, we hang out. Um, so this has just been a community event that we've built our observations on. And around that time that we started to find the old trash, one of our dear friends, Jeff Turner, who's a river keeper and now a river guard, uh, posted these pictures of logging in the area. And so he made the connection between 
the logging of the swamps and the releasing of this very old trash. Uh, so it, for us, the witnessing changes was actually witnessing changes in litter behavior, but that's what got us into more of a um, kind of a meta place of, well, where is that coming from and, and what industries are creating that? And then next slide. So that's a question like where, you know, what's going on in the watershed? And, and recently we've also started to learn more about the sand extraction. We know that in the 80s, one of our uh, burial sites, Raccoon Island, was mined and we don't know what happened with those remains. And so the making the connection between industries and policies and sites, you know, these are questions that we're starting to create internally, which is like, okay, what's going on? How can we protect them? Next slide. So where do we find solutions? <laughs> you know, what does the wampum model tell us? Well, we have to go back and we have to acknowledge our ancestral teachings. And I think that in, the entry does a great job in describing our collaborative process and our democratic process and how we function as a community. And so we have a democratically elected chief system, our tribal council. This is our current tri tribal council. This is um, one from several years ago. And sadly, we've lost two of our elders that are in this picture. So, you know, as a community, We've leaned heavily on our elders and their experiences, and they've always been a huge part of our governorship and teaching us how to how to be not away. You know, what are the attributes of who we are? Next slide. Uh, so how do we start to mend? If we know that we have changes that we've seen, there's problems, you know, we're, we're looking to our ancestors and the ways that we work really well together. How do we start to mend? And this is where I think this entry helps us so much, where we have to be able to articulate what the story of the watershed is, of, of who the Nottaway are, uh, what our connection to land is. You can learn more about Minley Turner. Um, we've been very busy over the past decade, plus getting these stories out. And so you can find us in the film of uh, the Virginia Historical Society Museum of Culture. Um, you can see us, uh, you know, Google us. There's a lot of places that we try to put ourselves in just to keep telling the story. And then we have uh, partnerships that are developing. Uh, this is a picture of Piney Grove. It's a nature conservancy site. We've been working uh, really well with the Nature Conservancy to see what we can do together. And one thing is that they have a stream on their property that is identified on the USGS system, but doesn't have a name. And so we're actually gonna use our language program uh, spearheaded by Ben there to rename the stream. And so, you know, restoring looks like a lot of different things. Next slide. And we've also collaboratively through a long process with our tribal council developed a tribal consultation mandate. And so we're saying like, okay, um, we wanna know what's going on all over the watershed. And just because policies don't exist now that are very strong and say, you must contact the tribe and you must work with us, like you would see in a federal sense and some other examples, there's nothing that says that we can't proactively state that we wish to be consulted. And so we as a tribe have adopted this mandate I've just highlighted some language. And so we're looking at all different levels of government. We want to work with them. You can see that there's logging and some sand. And you know, this was a recently logged place adjacent to the river. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can see that we are you know, calling out ancestral sites. We're identifying water and land features. We're saying that we recognize there's industries around. And you know, we, we want to be a part of that conversation. Next slide. And why do we want to do this? And so we're back on our, you know, our witness, acknowledge, mend, protect. But we have future generations. You know, Rick and I are a part of this beautiful time in Nottaway life where our elders have set the stage for us you know, through recognition processes, through a lot of this political maneuvering to be a, to be a person like out. We were quiet for so long, but now we can actively be a Nottaway person. And what makes us Nottaway is our connection to ourselves, to each other, to our community, our families. It's also our connection to the land and to the water and to our language. And that's what makes up our identity. So we have to protect these places in order for future generations to carry on that Nottaway identity. The next slide is gonna show you how we do it because we have to unite and we have to work with our uh, sister relatives and brothers, uh, you know, our, the, the top left picture, it's from last year. It's a gathering of Meher and Tuscarora and Nottaway people. So we have to work with our traditional relatives. Um, we have to work with state legislature and officials up in that top right. That's right after our state recognition. Uh, we have to unite with tribal nations across the country. This is me speaking at the Indigenous Peoples March in 2018. And then in my favorite way to unite 
is on the river together with, with each other. There's community partners in this picture. And it's how do we work together to learn about what's going on, build relationships, build trust, and then figure out what's the best way forward. Next slide. And it just here's my NASCAR <laughs> logo slide. And there are many more actual people that are groups that I could put on this slide. But you know, in order for us to create a movement, we have to one, work with partners that are like-minded and have the same goals as we do. We also, you know, need to work with government. We need humanities organizations to help us tell our story. And uh, it, you know, it's just more fun that way. And it's more much more effective. And my last slide tells you what's next and what we have coming up. And so if we were to talk a year from now, we're going to have a lot more to share. Um, but just to know that we have a water and land initiative that's underway that's going to involve GIS story mapping. And so we want to do more of this visual multimedia storytelling. Um, we're having some outdoor exhibits uh, installed at the Nottoway Community House and Interpretive Center. Um, paddles, um, please let us know if you want to join us on a paddle. Uh, we, we're doing community partner paddles. And we really just want you all to follow us and to support us. Um, recognize us, and of course, remember us. And so just so grateful uh, to share with y'all. So many thanks, Nawi. Thank you so much, Beth. And, and for folks who aren't familiar with the Nottoway River and the Nottoway River Basin, just give us some sense of the geography of you know, what counties and areas of Virginia we're talking about that it passes through. Absolutely. So um, we have what the, more current, I would say, like not away footprint of like who are where communities are, be Southampton, Sussex, and Surrey counties with Dinwiddie and Prince George thereabout. The Nottoway River watershed is starts in the Black Waters up in Surrey County reaches, you know, starts up into almost to Petersburg, not away the Black Water and meet at now the state line that forms the Chowan, and that flows down into the Albemarle Pamlico watershed, which is very uh, important because the Chesapeake Bay has protections that are stronger than Albemarle Pamlico protections, but we're working on it. <laughs> and and that, that leads me to my next question, or what are the, besides just sea level rise, what are the immediate environmental threats to the Nottoway River right now? Absolutely. So we have our eyes on agricultural uh, runoff. Um, we have our eyes on uh, the riparian buffer lack of um, from that runoff. And so when you have less protections on your cypress trees, for instance, then you, you're, you're losing that buffer, that filtration. So uh, what we see in the Chesapeake Bay watershed is it's very hard to log cypress trees, but in the Albemarle Pamlico, you have a much, um, there's a much easier path for loggers to do that. And so we're one, concerned about the deforestation for many reasons, losing these these uh, wetlands are, are immensely important to us culturally, but they have the, ec the ecosystem function. Um, we know that we're going into these, these drought seasons. And so we also worry about drought and fire and not having enough of our prescribed burn techniques employed uh, to hold those at bay. So we're really grateful for folks like the Nature Conservancy and, and Department of um, Historic Re or Conservation and Recreation and those folks that do that. Um, with sea level rise, an interesting uh, part of that is saltwater inundation. And so these cypress trees that we hold to be so culturally important to us actually it can't withstand a lot of salt. And so one of the interior ways that we can see sea level rise is through uh, the development of, uh, of ghost forests, which is an appropriately tragic name because you start to see these like um, these cypress groves start to deteriorate. Um, so it's, it's hitting us in a lot of different ways. We know that big rain events are coming. And so these monster rain events come and drop a lot of water down. Well, if we are disrupting our landscape, then we're not having that protection from the flood events. And then one other piece of that, uh, of the mining or and the logging is that there's a tremendous amount of our archeological resources that we uh, haven't yet had a chance to protect and explore. So if they are being degraded, then that's just so much information that we're not able to gain because we, we either lose it to erosion or we lose it to extraction. Thank you. Um, and, and for folks also who aren't familiar, um, I think maybe some people who do know something about Virginia Indian history might be a little more familiar with some of the Algonquin nations. But tell us a little bit, and either of you can answer this question, about the Iraq, 
Iroquoian tribal differences and both how those um, two tribal groups, I guess is the best way to put it, were separate, but also who you said are your, your cousins in the long run and how you're related to each other. I'll take a pause, Rick. You want to you want to start with that one, and I'll fill in. Okay. Um, well, so you heard Beth uh, speak of um, our our language group and our cultural group, and, and that is Iroquois. Um, and so uh, we share tradition and culture not only with the Meharan, okay, who are right across what's now the line between Virginia and North Carolina. I mean, it it's remarkable um, if you travel down Route 35 in Virginia. Okay, you'll come from Sebril, that area, that circle part of the reservation. You'll go through the square and you'll end up right in Ahoski, North Carolina, where the Meharan are currently. And it just made me think one day, I was like, hmm, I wonder how long this road has actually been here. Okay, you know, well before there was a Route 35, I'm thinking that quite often we probably traveled that same path. So um, we were folks of the Longhouse, uh, you know, is, um, that's where where we dwelt. Okay, that's uh, our our cultural structure. I mean, you see a, a lot of influences in terms of uh, how we conduct ourselves. Okay, we use a democratic form of government. That's very important to us. Um, and quite often, our tribes are led by women. Okay, uh, which is different than I think a lot of the uh, historic portrayals of what you expect to see of an Indian chief. You know. Um, so uh, those are all things that you find among Iroquois people. Um, obviously, uh, when people think of Iroquois, they think of the Iroquois Confederacy, which is in the north. Beth mentioned that those uh, six nations, um, of which you know a, an important part of uh, American history comes from, in that the United States Constitution is based on the Great Law of Peace of, of the Iroquois Confederacy. So those are all things um, that relate to us. As far as us and Algonquins, um, we probably didn't get along too well. Um, um, but uh, one thing that's interesting about our history um, is that a role that we played in, in early colonial Virginia is that our towns became, became kind of like uh, the Switzerland. We'll just put it that way um, for uh, colonists for, um, as well as for other tribes to come and conduct business and, and sign treaties and things like that. So we were seen as kind of like a place where people could come and get together. Um, and so um, as you look through the history of Virginia, you will see that time and time again. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of times when I start talking about Virginia Indians, I ask people who the, the most famous Native American they know of. And usually it'll, it'll get around to Pocahontas. Uh, and then I ask them, do they know where Pocahontas is from? and you get the long pause. A lot of people do not know that Pocahontas was a Virginia Indian, okay? And that she was a, a member of the Powhatan Confederacy. I think the tribe she's most closely associated with, associated with these days is, is the Pamunkey people. Again, you know, names that are not familiar um, to a lot of people. So, um, you know, once the uh, English start to spread, as, as Beth mentioned, you know, from right there around the, the James River by about 1650, you know, they were surveying where we were, okay, and uh, um, and that's where our first contact came in. Uh, back to your original question, Patty, about what I like about the article. I think one of the things that I, I really appreciate is bringing back to life some long, well, not for academics, but for the rest of us, um, some long, perhaps um, ignored sources of information about our history. You know, when we think about Edward Bland, okay, and his survey of Virginia, in which he describes us, okay, so we have a first person uh, description of what uh, Nottoway people were like, you know, in 1650, which is just absolutely, I think, indescribably valuable for us now. To it's it's the the closest thing we have to a uh, to a. Uh, a cell phone with a with the pocket camera on it. You know his descriptions of our towns, of of the way we physically look, how we live, things like that. So I I, I speak more from the, the Nottoway, the Iroquois perspective, um, than perhaps the Algonquins. I'm not as familiar with um, their structure other than what I've read. So I, I, I tend to not try and hold forth on it too much. I will tell you though that one of the 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 uh, most common words that you hear today, powwow, comes from the Algonquin. So 
Uh, and it was just a word for healer you know, or elder uh, initially. And, and you know, people gather where there's a, an elder or a healer. And so now it, it's come to mean gathering. And, and tell us, Rick, you talked about um, democratic government is very important value um, to the Nottaway. What other values that you would have seen, you know, in 1650 are still current within the Nottaway people today? Okay, so let's look at Beth and let's look at everything that she just talked about. And a huge value for us is our land. Um, the land itself, our love for the land, uh, what it means to us. I, you know, I, I had a, a dear friend say to me, he said, you know, you not away are, are really kind of stuck on this whole land thing. You know, in my family, we get a piece of land, we sell it. And for us, it's exactly opposite. You know, if we get a, we're trying to get, get our land and hold on to it. And it's, it's very, very dear to us. Um, you raise a really important, uh, uh, I guess, point, Patty, when you ask about what, you know, kind of values, you know, along with um, colonization, okay, and this is the history that we all know about, you know, quite often we're forced to abandon outward cultural practices, whether that was our language, how we dressed, you know, um, many things that were frightening or offensive to, to the colonists, but um, I like to talk about deep culture, and those are the things that, that pass from mother to child, from father to son, mother to daughter, uh, that you can't ever get rid of, okay? The things that are just deeply important to us, the, the land is one of them. Education is a huge one. Um, so the article here is, is, is very, very exciting to us. Uh, how we regard um, the elders in our, in our, fan, in our, in our tribe, um, we recognize them for what they are, just an absolute blessing from our creator uh, that provide us with uh, tremendous wisdom and knowledge of our people. You know, uh, many of the things that we know have been passed down orally you know, uh, from um, each generation to, to the succeeding generation. So, you know, in terms of, you know, cultural values, certainly I, I would speak of uh, our families, um, how we treat our elders, the, the land, Education is really, really uh, important things to 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 not away people. We talk about our, our form of government, and you know, along with that is the need to work collaboratively. Um, that's really important to us. That you know, as a tribe, that we work together to accomplish our aims. And and this is a, really a question for either of you. I think people might be surprised to learn, given that, as you said, that the Nottaway have been in Virginia for, for so long, that both federal and state recognition of the tribe is relatively recent. Um, what years did you get uh, federal and state recognition for the Nottaway tribe? Okay, so we are a state recognized tribe in Virginia. Uh, and that occurred at, in 2010. Beth smiles because uh, she was uh, intimately involved in a, a lot of the effort uh, uh, for state recognition. Um, and just so people understand what that means, it means that uh, the state of Virginia recognizes our sovereignty, okay, in that we existed prior to, you know, the coming of the state of Virginia. Um, so an acknowledgement of, of that fact, certainly federal recognition is a government to government recognition um, between the United States government and a, and a tribal government. And, and we will have coming up soon as part of our uh, series, we are developing on various aspects of Virginian Indian culture and politics and history, an entry on the, the tribal recognition process for people who are interested in that, because I know it was a long process to get that recognition. Um, so we will have an entry coming up that, that deals with that for people who are interested in kind of diving into that a little bit more. Um, Beth, one thing that you talked about that I was interested in is you talked about a rights-based approach to the river. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Absolutely. Um, so when you shared with our Thanksgiving address, you know, it's it's looking at the people, it's looking at our land and our water, and it goes on and on. And I'm, you know, literally birds, four-legged animals, trees, medicines, foods, it goes in every uh, element of creation. And what we're recognizing in that is that 
you know, that we are of nature. We are not over nature. We are of it and that we have this holistic and interdependent relationship with it. And so, you know, nature has rights. It's, uh, I was, as that are inherent, but yet aren't always recognized. And then as native people, we have rights to uh, our, you know, to our lands and our histories that we were, you know, removed from or oppressed from, or like, you know, not able to tell our story about. And this shows up in not only accessing ancestral um, burial sites, but it also shows up in just how do we get on the water? Like our our good friends, Blackwater Nottaway Outfitters hold relationships to landowners that allow us to get on the water and paddle about. But something so inherent as how does a tribe get on the water to commune with water, to be a person, sometimes is very limited to actually getting to the water and to be able, you know, and um, so there's, you know, one, just recognizing that we need to protect these things because they have inherent rights we as a community have inherent rights because of our nature or our connections to it. It's just that goes back thousands of years. And if we lead with that, this is an equity issue and not just like a sidebar we should or a checkbox, but this is an actual equity issue, then I think we're much more in tune with getting us to the table to let's say co-steward. And that's a very big thing. And so if you'll entertain me like for a minute, I have a definition of land and water back that I've been working on just through the, the, the work of our tribe. And, and a lot of folks, you know, have, they hear land back and they have questions or they have perceptions. And so here, here's my shot at it. One, what is land back? Is it actual physical land back? Like we've transferred land back. Like, yes, it's that. Is that easy to do? No, <laughs> it's one of the hardest things. I mean, that really amazing efforts by all the communities you can see in the news of like, you know, recently Upper Mattapanai and Rappahannock and, you know, Monica have gotten land back. I mean, like these take massive efforts of funding and agencies and grants and all these things. It's hard work. Two, so land back is actual land back. But then two, could land back also be code stewardship? Could you bring us to the table? I was a park ranger for Virginia State Parks for 10 years. I worked for North Carolina Commission on Indian Affairs down here and Department of Environmental Quality. Um, you know, our I work for the James River Association. So been in these places where you have non-governmental agencies, you have state and federal local agencies all at the table. And you know there is a huge void if we're not there, if we're not at the table telling our story and our connections and kind of like digging, unraveling these centuries of, of, of stories and, and barriers uh, to why we're not actively engaged and, and are, you know, are active owners of it. I mean, you know, you, you ask about the recognition process and lack of recognition for us, even though we have all of the federal and all this and it took so long, isn't a commentary on whether or not we deserved it. It's more of a commentary on the system. And so very excited that y'all are going to be diving in on that because people really need to understand the recognition system and why that has, you know, prevented us from for being in, in play now. So co-management, co-stewardship, can we get to the table? Can we work with people like DCR and, and Nature Conservancy and others and actually be active participants in management? But then this third piece of land back is so dependent on how do we restory the narrative? Because if you if you don't know who we are, if you don't know who Nottaway people are, if you don't know where our ancestors you know, were and are and, and where our interests are and, if, and understand how we got removed from the table and how it's like, we had this massive land base and then we were contracted. And now, you know, like now we're trying to get back out, right? Just because we were forced into this little reservation system doesn't mean that we don't want to go back to Great Town. It doesn't mean we don't want to go back to the places that, you know, were these really prominent sites for us. But in order for us to even get to the table of number two, and before we can even write a grant or, for, or go for a land back, we have to have that story locked in. And so many folks have to have a reputable, respectable place like Virginia Humanities Encyclopedia Virginia to go to and see like, oh, look at this amazing, cited, concise history of these people. Now I have a place that I can go to that'll help inform me on my, on my engagement with these people. So, so much heavy lifting went into that article. And now that gives us so much, um, so much more power. And I think in, in this effort.
And, and I really encourage people to dive into that entry to, to really get the whole story of how that shrinkage happened, because it is relatively recent history. I mean, certainly to the Nottaway, it's very recent history. This was mostly 19th century history when a lot of this land was put under various forms of stewardship and sold off. Um, so I encourage people to really dive into that, to understand that it's more than we can go into at the moment. Um, and we do have a question. I don't know if either of you can answer this, but someone's researching Chapel Hill, North Carolina history, and they're interested to know if the Nottaway made it as far as that part of North Carolina. Is are there Nottaway in that part of the of the region, to your knowledge? So I would answer this with the broader sense of like we're our relatives, like Nottaway and the Heron like the, the funny thing about like you know the native community is it's like you approach by somebody asking like who's your people <laughs> it's like who are your family lines and so much many of us that are married and you know these these territories were shifting so in that broad sense i think you would have to you know it would be a deeper conversation or a more broader conversation or a broader conversation that we would need to say well let's let's talk about this confederacy this massive footprint that the iroquoian language speakers had and then i think we could get you know, it depends on when you're talking about <laughs> to some degree, um, but it's it's a great question because it's it's not yeah. always so clear. And you know, um, just to add a little more um, context, you know, there's a dance um, in the Iroquois Confederacy called the Alligator Dance. Okay, and there are no alligators in upstate New York. Okay, not that we're <laughs> aware of. Okay, but they got it from Seminole people. So. Now, for those who don't know, the Seminole are in Florida. So it's a long way from uh, New York to Florida. But the point I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to make is that, you know, prior to what we know as, as the United States of America, people traveled even then. Okay, so it's not really a stretch to think of Nottaway people, you know, being as far south as, as Chapel Hill. Uh, although I, I can't speak to you know, whether that was or it wasn't, but it wouldn't surprise me. Let me put it to you that way. Uh, the fact that, you know, people from all the way up north traveled all the way south and were given a dance by um, the Seminole in Florida and then traveled back with it. So we have uh, covered a lot of ground. And, and the Iroquois are up and down the east coast of the United States of America. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I want to start wrapping it up, but I want to give each of you a chance to tell us one last thing. What's something you want us to know about the Nottaway, either in history or today? What's your kind of takeaway you want to leave people with? Why don't you go first, Rick? Mm, okay. Um, so, um, and I, I guess sometimes the most obvious thing is uh, the thing that you forget to mention when you're asking me about cultural values, but you heard Beth speak about it earlier, okay? And that is thankfulness. Um, and um, that is a deeply held value um, for us culturally, I know for me personally, um, thankfulness for all that we have, all that we've been blessed with. Um, and so again, opportunities uh, like this to tell our story uh, through the actual uh, entry in Encyclopedia Virginia, which as I think about it, it just, um, it's really exciting for me because um, the Encyclopedia of Virginia is designed as a resource for students here in the state of Virginia. And, um, and to have an opportunity to provide them with a resource that is accurate, okay? And I like to think very interesting, okay? Entertaining even. Um, you could actually read this article and be like, hey, hey wow, I enjoyed myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading history, even for our non-history lovers out there. Um, so that's probably where I would go uh, right off the top. The, I would leave you with that um, element of thankfulness uh, for, for this opportunity today, for, for this article, um, and generally for the blessings of, of the Nottaway um, here in this land uh, where we have been for so long. And Beth, how about you? I was just like so into like listening to Rick. I'm like nodding my head. Like, no way, I have to have an answer. It was beautiful knowing. Um, is you know what I would love for y'all to to see and witness from the article and then the interpretive tour and um, what's to come is 
self-determination can look like a lot of things. And one self-determination is showing up for us and telling our own story and setting the record straight. And we've even, you know, we had to publish a book <laughs> 10 years ago, Dutra Tongue, to get ourselves into these academic records. And so uh, one, it's showing up in like, okay, we got a course correct history, right? And we're gonna lean on that. Um, the, what I'm so proud of and deeply grateful for within our community is self-determination in terms of how we are showing up uh, in protection of our waters and our lands and our ancestors. And this is all during a rapidly changing climate. And so, you know, while we are going backwards and learning about our ancestors and traditional ecological knowledge, we are recognizing that we that, that we need to adapt that in real time and that we need to also develop practices and understandings that, that are gonna become the next generation's ancestral teachings. And so when you see us in Clean River Day with the garden, with our water and land back initiative, with our GIS story mapping and efforts like this, it's all built around the self-determination of how we wanna see life going forward. And so uh, just know that there is so much more to come and that um, just stay with us because you're going to see a lot more of this enriching self-determination, not only in our storytelling, but in all of our water and land and, and um, efforts and that the community is really rallying around that. And, and we have lots of questions about how people can kind of keep up with what the Nottaway are doing. I know one way um, to learn more about the tribe is through your annual powwow. Do either of you want to talk about that, when it is, where it is, if that's open to the public? Take sure. it it's your committee. We, we can both talk about it. But uh, so by its just very nature, the powwow is open to the public. OK, and it's an opportunity for us to celebrate and share our culture with everyone who wants to come and celebrate with us. And uh, the, the Nottaway Indian Tribe of Virginia powwow is always the same time every year. So you can mark your calendars uh, by it. We're always the third weekend in September. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I believe that is the 16th and the 17th of September, 2023. Uh, I'll pull up my calendar while we're, we're talking here. We'll see if I have that right. Uh, where you can come to um, Surrey Parks and Recreation Grounds in uh, Surrey County, Virginia. Um, and what is really uh, neat about it is we're right on the James River where our powwow grounds are. So for those who want to understand more about early Virginia, they can come to our powwow and uh, party with the natives. OK, and then if they want to cross the James River, they can go visit Jamestown, you know, and, and check out some of the colonial era history um, <clears throat> as well. But um, that is uh, certainly a, a great time to, to come and learn more about our culture, meet us. Um, our powwow is uh, uh, very much a family event. So feel free to bring your your family, your oldest to your youngest. <clears throat> we uh, do our best to accommodate uh, everyone's elders. And um, it's also very important to us that we honor our veterans. So that's all a part of, of uh, the powwow events that we have. And yes, it is the 16th and the 17th of 2023. The other thing I would uh, encourage people is our, our Nottaway Interpretive Center in Capron, Virginia uh, is open by appointment. Um, and you can come and um, see the museum that we have there. As uh, Beth mentioned earlier, we continue to build that space out to uh, make it even more uh, valuable for the study of the history of Nottaway people and for you to come um, and, and get to know us. And certainly uh, we try to involve ourselves uh, in the lives of our community. So uh, we do have the, uh, the uh, shoot, Beth, the name of the market that we have. The Artisan Market. Uh, yeah. Thank you, the Artisan Market. Okay, um, senior moment there. The, uh, where we invite uh, our, you know, the artisans in, in the, the Southampton and Surrey communities to come to the tribal house and we have a market where they can sell their wares. Kind of like a farmer's market for really cool um, uh, artisanal kind of uh, items. So if you need baskets, you need pottery, you need jewelry. I mean, just about anything that the people in uh, that area come up with, it's it's pretty remarkable. So I encourage people to check that out as well. Yeah, then you can see our um, virtual powwow, which we had to have. There was a ma massive production on our Facebook page, which also has updates as to like where we are, when, and who's got, got what going on. So. There's that. And then you can also come um, help us out with Clean River Day. So it's always the closest Saturday to Earth, Earth Day in, in 2023. It is on Earth Day, April 22nd. Um, 
So Facebook is really the most, uh, I think, you know, up-to-date um, place, but um, there's for you to come and connect. And is that just people. under the Nottaway Indian Tribe of Virginia? Would that be how people would find you on Facebook? There's a, yes. an official in the parentheses somewhere. So you got to have the official. Oh, the official. Okay, okay great. Yeah, so look for Nottaway Indian Tribe of Virginia and you'll find us. Perfect. Well, Rick and Beth, we are so thankful for you for your time today, but also for the time and care um, you put into this entry and for partnering with Encyclopedia Virginia on this entry. It's just going to be such a, a highlight of our site, we know, and we really encourage people to take a look at it. Um, and we thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, if you found today's event valuable, please consider becoming a supporter of Encyclopedia Virginia. Your donations make a possible to keep events like this free for everyone and to keep our um, our website free for the entire Virginia community. I will drop a link in the chat to um, our site for that. And you can also stay up to date on all our latest entries and all the things going on at Encyclopedia Virginia by subscribing to our newsletter. And I will put that link in the chat as well. So thank you, Rick and Beth. It was such a pleasure. Um, everyone, please read our new entry. We're so happy with it and have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye. Oh, hey, Patty, um, one word in Nottaway for you all. Okay, so if, if you want to uh, say thank you in Nottaway, you can just say Nyawe. Nyawe. Okay, is what we say to you all. Nyawe. Nyawe. Hey Beth, I think uh... are we still live, Beth? See you, Beth. <laughs>